The Where Our Minds Wanda podcast may contain sensitive content and explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to Where Our Minds Wander, all you fellow wanders. For all of you new listeners out there uh, that are just joining us, I'm Wes and that's my wife and co-host Beth. Hello everyone. So we're pretty proud to announce that last week marked the first anniversary of Where Our Minds Wander podcast. And what a week it was. We hit 10,000 downloads and Beth had a call in with Jim Harold, the OG of paranormal podcasting. So her story should air Roughly around the same day this one actually does. It was an awesome experience, actually. I mean, I've called in before, and we've been fans for a really, really long time. But it's always cool to talk to your idols, because not everyone gets a chance to do that in life. No, and I've got to say that he was a really nice, down-to-earth guy. Even though he had a lot of people scheduled that day to share their stories with the campfire, he took the time to chat with us before our story. So that's just nice knowing he had very little time that day and he actually took the time to chat with us a little bit, make us feel welcomed. And for those of you who haven't heard us mention Jim Harold before, he has several podcasts. The You Won't Believe What Happened to Me podcast with his wife, Dar. And he also has the Paranormal Podcast, where he interviews paranormal experts. And he also has Jim Harold's Campfire, where people call in and tell their personal paranormal experiences. So he's a really, really busy guy. And if you've never checked out any of his shows before, we highly recommend them. We've been listening to them for years. So this time when I called in, I told him about the EVPs that we had caught at the Tilly Pierce Inn which we did an episode on ourselves way back in the beginning of our show. But I thought it was really cool that you had sent him the EVPs ahead of time, and he was nice enough to play them during the episode so everybody would get to hear them. So it was just really, really cool. It was super cool. And speaking of way back in the beginning, we did not expect to grow our listenership as quickly as we have. And so, as always, we thank each and Every one of you for listening to us. Yeah, it really makes all the long hours of researching and all the hard work it requires to put out uh, new episodes each week. It, it makes it all worth it. So we would be remiss if we didn't take at least a few minutes to bring up the UFO news from last week. First, the whistleblower David Grush came out and said the U.S. government has been recovering non-human spacecraft for decades. Grush was part of the government UAP analysis program for years, and he worked for the Department of Defense for 14 years. So super credible source there. Right. That was some pretty strange news to hear. And also, just a few days later, police officers patrolling out in Las Vegas caught a blue light streaking across the sky and then heard a boom as though something had crashed. And this was captured on their patrol car's dash cams and their body cams. Soon after, a family from Las Vegas called in to 911 saying that an 8 to 10 foot creature or creatures were in their backyard. It was totally wild. And the story is everywhere. Even international news agencies have picked up this story. Right. And I don't want to give it away. But the footage is pretty awesome. The police officers find this family very credible, and they're doing follow-up investigations, so there should be more to come. So if you haven't seen this video with the call to 911, we're going to post it on our Facebook page so you can all check it out. And like Wes said, it's just, it's totally wild. You should check it out if you haven't seen it yet. All righty. Um, with all that said, let's get started. Uh, what are you talking about tonight? A real-life Indiana Jones. Oh, boy. <laughs> Every movie ever made about jungle explorers in the early 20th century 
could have used Percy Fawcett as inspiration. Complete with outlandish mustache, soulful eyes, a cigar, and a pith helmet, Percy Fawcett embodies every romantic ideal the word explorer conjures up in every single photograph of him ever taken. Just picture a younger Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones, and you've got almost a dead ringer for Percy Fawcett. In fact, Indiana Jones was reportedly based on Percy Fawcett. Fawcett was dashing, a man's man, and he wasn't all talk. He actually lived a life worth commending. Oh, and he also went into the vast jungles of South America in 1925 in search of the lost, fabled City of Z and disappeared forever. Fawcett was born on August 18, 1867. Exploration seemed to run in his family. His father was a fellow of the Royal Geography Society, and his brother was a mountain climber, eastern occultist, and popular adventure novelist. As a young man, Fawcett had quite the military career. He was commissioned as a lieutenant of the Royal Artillery at the age of 19, before serving in Hong Kong and Malta. In 1901, at the age of 34, he joined the Royal Geography Society as well, in order to study map-making. Then he worked in North Africa as a member of the British Secret Service, as a spy. Just four years later, he was promoted to major while stationed in Ireland, and after befriending Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, our guy, Sir Arthur Conan, that he is, he was the inspiration for Doyle's novel, The Lost World. Besides being a professional cartographer, he was also an amateur archaeologist. But of all the places in the world that he had visited, the Amazon truly fascinated him. He called it, quote, the last great blank space in the world, end quote. Meaning, map-wise, of course. The first time he went there was in 1906 as an independent cartographer for the Royal Geographical Society. He was tasked with drawing maps of the border between Brazil and Bolivia. He reportedly had a pretty good relationship with the native people, and despite suffering tick bites, near starvation, and having to shoot his own horse, he kept going back. Over the next 18 years, he led seven expeditions to the Amazon region. In 1908, he mapped the source of the Rio Verde in Brazil, and in 1910, he mapped the source of the Heath River, which is on the border of Bolivia and Peru. In 1911, he made his fourth trip, this time accompanied by his longtime friend Henry Coston and polar explorer James Murray. Murray was an accomplished explorer in his own right. He had served on the Nimrod expedition with Ernest Shackleton. He was 46 when he joined Fawcett's Peru-Bolivia border expedition, and it seems like things did not end very well between them. The Amazon jungle was not kind. Fawcett had already dealt with anacondas, vampire bats, piranhas, flesh-eating maggots, mosquitoes, and poison arrow attacks. James Murray struggled with the conditions. At some point, Fawcett diverted the expedition so Murray could leave and recover from his poor health in Tambopata, Peru. When he returned home in 1912, he was pretty dismayed to find out that everyone thought he was dead. He was so angry that he wanted to sue Fawcett, claiming Fawcett purposely risked his life, but the Geographical Society talked him out of it. In 1913, Fawcett claimed to have encountered dogs with double noses. These double-nosed dogs turned out to be real. They were Andean tiger hounds, and they do have some pretty funky noses. They're kind of split down the middle so that each nostril seems to be part of a separate nose. Now, I had mentioned that Fawcett was friends with Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and that Doyle had even based a main character on him. Well, for any of you who have listened to our show for a while, we've talked before about how Doyle's name comes up over and over and over. He knew 
everyone and had his hands in everything related to the supernatural. Yeah, he was everywhere. Everywhere. And Fawcett, like Doyle, was a spiritualist. There were rumors that Fawcett consulted a Ouija board before making strategic decisions during his war years, and he would use one during seances to contact his deceased mother. Sometime around 1914, Fawcett started talking about this amazing lost city that he believed was somewhere in the Amazon jungle of Brazil. He called it Z, or Zed. He thought it was an incredibly complex civilization, and its ruins must still be there somewhere. He based his beliefs on the topography he had already mapped and shards of pottery he had found. He also thought he could see remnants of well-used roads. The scientific community wasn't too keen to support his claim, but the spiritualists, like Madame Blavatsky, certainly were. We've briefly mentioned Madame Blavatsky before. She was a very popular early medium in the spiritualism movement. Fawcett convinced people that he may have found proof of El Dorado or possibly Atlantis. He had come across a document in the National Library in Rio de Janeiro called Manuscript 512 that was written by a Portuguese Bandeirante in 1753. Bandeirantes were explorers, but they were also fortune hunters. In the document, the explorer, whose name I totally cannot pronounce, I don't even know if I should try. Go ahead. (laughs) Yao da Silva Guimaraes? Sounds about right. I don't even think it's close. But he said he'd found ruins of an ancient city. There were stone arches, statues, and a temple covered in hieroglyphs. Although Fawcett didn't think that this was the exact same lost city that he thought was out there, it did give him some validation that finding Z was possible. I guess he figured if there was one massive city ruin, there had to be more. Fawcett set his sights on the Mato Grosso region of Brazil. Mato Grosso translates to thick forest, and the area was considered incredibly treacherous, hence the piranhas and bats and poison arrows that I mentioned. In 1925, Fawcett and his 21-year-old son Jack, as well as Jack's friend Raleigh Rimmel, which is just a cool name, mounted one last expedition to find the lost city of Z. Now, the interesting part is that Fawcett had a bunch of people who really wanted to go with him, like T.E. Lawrence, who was otherwise known as Lawrence of Arabia. But he turned everyone down. It was almost as if he wanted this expedition's findings to kind of stay within the family. And it's important to remember this part, because it could be important later. Fawcett, by the way, was 58 years old. Well, that's not old. It is if you're out traipsing around in the jungle. Yeah, I guess so. (laughs) Fighting off piranhas and (laughs) Yeah, it doesn't matter what age you are. I wouldn't want to be out in the jungle fighting off bats and anacondas and all the other creepy crap that hangs out (laughs) there. (laughs) They set sail from New Jersey, and among their cargo was custom-made machetes, mosquito netting, canned food, rifles, powdered milk, a chronometer, sextant, and a ukulele. Why not? Fawcett confidently told reporters, quote, we shall return and we shall bring back what we seek, end quote. Once they arrived in Rio, they went to an outpost where they bought eight pack animals and hired two native guides. They also had two horses and a pair of dogs. On April 20th, they entered the jungle. Their first issue was with the insects. Mosquitoes, gnats, and ticks were a constant problem, making it difficult to sleep. Raleigh Rimmel's foot even became painfully swollen due to tick bites just within the first few weeks. Fawcett, though, didn't let that or the youngsters hold him back. He traveled 10 to 15 miles a day, sometimes getting so far ahead of his son and his friend 
that he ended up camping alone while he waited for them to catch up. Nine days after they entered the jungle, they arrived at Dead Horse Camp, named because that was where Fawcett was forced to shoot his horse on a previous expedition. Once they got there, he gave his native guides a letter to be sent to his wife. In the letter, he discussed the hardships they had faced so far and doubts that he had about Rimmel. He also included his coordinates, which were latitude 11 degrees, 43 hours south, and longitude 54 degrees, 35 hours west, noting it was the very same spot where his horse had died five years earlier. The letter ended with, quote, Jack is well and fit and getting stronger every day. You need have no fear of any failure, end quote. Then he sent the native guides away. So now it was only the three of them. Fawcett, Jack, and Raleigh Rimmel. They ventured further into the jungle alone. And that was the last time anyone ever heard from them. Now, to be fair, Fawcett had warned that the expedition wouldn't be heard from for some time. Remember, he had sent those guides away, and he didn't want them to come back and rejoin the expedition. But with their disappearance which didn't register with authorities as a disappearance until two years later, well, there were a lot of questions. Things just didn't add up. First of all, Fawcett had left explicit instructions that if the three of them were to become lost, no rescue team should be sent in after them. Second of all, the coordinates he had sent Nina, his wife, for Dead Horse Camp did not match the coordinates he had submitted in an earlier report. In the earlier report, which was published in the North American Newspaper Alliance, he said that Dead Horse Camp was 13 degrees south latitude, a difference of 2 degrees. Now, some experts argue that it was just a typo, but others say that Fawcett deliberately gave the wrong coordinates because he didn't want to chance anyone else finding the lost city of Z before he did. So, it's 1927, and no one has heard from Fawcett for two years. The Royal Geographical Society declared the expedition as lost. That same year, a nameplate belonging to Fawcett was discovered with a native tribe. It was in possession of the chief. But it was determined that the nameplate was from the expedition five years earlier, so it didn't lead to any clues about what had happened to them. In June of 1933, Fawcett's compass was discovered by natives in the Mato Grosso, but experts determined that Fawcett had accidentally left it behind before he sent those guides away and entered the remaining jungle with just Jack and Rimmel. But back to 1928. The Royal Geographical Society launched the first of many expeditions to locate the missing men, even though he told them not to. A man named George Miller Diot led the rescue or recovery expedition. He returned with no evidence, including no bodies, and it was his personal opinion that Fawcett and his son and Rimmel had all died in the jungle. Newspapers at that time began writing all kinds of theories, that they had been attacked and killed by natives, for example. And there were plenty of people who jumped on that bandwagon. I mean, it does seem like a plausible explanation. There were several tribes in the area, and Fawcett entered all of their territory at various times during his journey. Explorer and Amazon tribal expert John Fleming believes that Fawcett was most likely killed by indigenous people because there were only three of them, and Fawcett seemed to assume that the native people would simply welcome them and look after them. Fleming suggests that Fawcett didn't bring enough gifts to thank the local tribes for helping them, which may have antagonized them. In fact, the Calipalo tribe has an oral story in which three explorers did arrive. Two of them were lame and ill. They said that after five days, they no longer noticed any campfires. They believed a more violent tribe killed them. 
20 years after Fawcett disappeared, a Kalapalo chief named Komatsi claimed to be in possession of Fawcett's remains. His predecessor, a chief named Izazari, said that he had killed Fawcett and Jack himself after they had attacked him for refusing to give them guides and porters. He said he used poisoned arrows. He also said that it was just the two of them. Rimmel had already passed away from a fever. In 1951, an activist for the indigenous people named Orlando Villaboas said that Chief Izarari had told him personally that he had killed all three explorers. Jack had allegedly consorted with one of his wives, and Fawcett had slapped the chief across the face when he refused to give the men canoes and porters. In retaliation, the chief had clubbed all three men to death. So, perhaps Fawcett didn't have the best relationship with the Native people that he claimed he had. It doesn't sound it. Boas said he had the actual remains, and he had them analyzed. They allegedly came back as a positive match for Fawcett, but Fawcett's remaining living son, Brian, disputed that. Boas then accused Brian of not wanting his father's remains to be found because it would cut into his book sales about his father's unsolved disappearance. That seems kind of wrong. <laughs> Further testing, though, proved that the bones weren't Fawcett's at all, or Jack's, or Rimmel's. In the 1960s, a Danish explorer named Arne Falk Ron trekked into the Mato Grosso region, and he spoke with Villa Boas as well. This time, Villa Boas said that all of the gifts that Fawcett had brought for the Native people were lost during a river accident, and because they arrived without gifts and both Jack and Rimmel were ill, the Kalapalo tribesmen killed them all. They threw Jack and Rimmel into the river, but buried Fawcett due to his considerable age. Wow. (laughs) Since he was older, he was more distinguished and deserved a more respectful burial, supposedly. But in 1979, Fawcett's signet ring was found in a pawn shop. So... Since there was no hard evidence that Fawcett and the two younger men were actually murdered, another theory arose and became incredibly popular. Perhaps Fawcett had found the lost city of Z after all and had decided to stay there. Supporters of the theory point out that Fawcett explicitly told everyone that if he disappeared, nobody should come look for him. Then, there was the fact that he only had his son and Rimmel with him, implying that he didn't want anyone else to know exactly where he went. He was very secretive, actually. All of his letters to his wife Nina were written in code, and she was the only person that had the cipher to decrypt it. Anyway, Fawcett's biggest rival, as far as he perceived it, was the American explorer Alexander Hamilton Rice. Fawcett felt an incredible need to beat Rice to the discovery, especially since he felt Rice was horrible to the indigenous people. He said Rice had murdered an entire group of Yanomami and brought bombs to ward off cannibals. So, it's only my conjecture here, conjecture, but Perhaps Fawcett did find the lost city of Z and chose to stay there in order to protect his find and the native people. I think the natives got a hold of him, did him in. Well, I think that's probably the most logical logical explanation, but we don't know for sure. And that's why I'm talking about it, because it's a mystery. According to an article in The Guardian that I found, the theory that he found the lost city and stayed there does hold some weight. A filmmaker named Misha Williams was granted access to Fawcett's personal papers and discovered that Fawcett's real plan, which he referred to as his grand scheme, was to set up a commune at the city of Z based on the spiritual teachings of theosophy. So theosophy is pretty complex, at least to me it is, 
and it involves specific beliefs about cosmology, reincarnation, and supreme beings or master adepts. And it was popularized, popularized. <laughs> I'll try that again. You should. It was popularized by Madame Blavatsky, and she was part of the core of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which we've talked about. That we have. So, according to Williams, Fawcett wrote, quote, The English go native very easily. There is no disgrace in it. On the contrary, in my opinion, it shows a credible regard for the real things in life, end quote. Part of his grand scheme was for his son Jack to be worshipped by all the members of the commune. Which, if you think back to the whole Hermetic Order and Blavatsky and the spiritualism, that's part of what they would do. Exactly, right. <laughs> Supporters of this commune idea think that Fawcett not only survived his jungle exploration, but also lived out the rest of his life there. Now, Obviously, he didn't begin a long-lasting commune that stood, a test, stood the test of time or would still be there. But who knows what he might have established in the short term. Now, this next part I find truly ironic. The same year that Fawcett disappeared, 1925, the incredible complex of Kuikugu was discovered. Kuikugu was massive. It covered 7,700 square miles. It included 20 separate towns and housed 50,000 people until the 1500s. They had extensive roads built at precise right angles. They cultivated fields, orchards, and fish farms. They had monuments to their gods and concentric circles of moats, which sounds very Atlantis-like. Somewhat, yes. And it was discovered in the Mato Grosso. There are quite a few experts who believe that Fawcett had already found it, that his lost city of Z was there all along, and that the shards of pottery he'd found and the evidence of roads he thought he saw match up with what was actually discovered at Kuikugu. However, he didn't stay there in 1925. Instead, he and his son and Jack and Raleigh Rimmel trekked further into the jungle, only to disappear forever. And as a last note, Nina Fawcett, Percy's wife and Jack's mother, believed until her death that neither her husband nor her son had perished in the jungle. She steadfastly told reporters, quote, There is consequently still no proof that the three explorers are dead. Very interesting. I thought it was cool. It is very cool. Especially when you mix spiritualism into all of that. Yeah. It's just, it's a whole mishmash of all different kinds of things. Hey, did you know... In 1915, Campbell's added alphabet noodles to their vegetable soup, which had been around since 1889. In 2022, Jacob Chandler of Oregon found all 26 letters of the alphabet in a can of soup and then made a world record by placing them in order in just 2 minutes and 8.6 seconds. The hardest part? Telling the difference between the M and the W. Who'd have thunk it? So what are you talking about tonight? Well, for tonight's story, we're traveling to Colonial Williamsburg in Virginia, and I'm going to talk about some of the history and paranormal experiences surrounding the Peyton Randolph House. Now, for those of you who don't know, I'm incredibly fascinated by stories from security guards. You know, the ones working at hospitals and old hotels and museums, you know, places with a lot of history. So we're going to start off with a guard's experience that he was having while he was on duty at the Peyton Randolph House. Security guards at the Peyton Randolph House in Colonial Williamsburg have had some unsettling experiences. 
I watched a fascinating interview online that was done by the U.S. Ghost Adventures, and they interviewed a former security guard named Pedro Jones. He described an experience he had one night in the 1970s. He had finished his rounds upstairs, and he went down into the basement. There was no one else down there but him, and he spent a few minutes looking at a magazine on a table. Then, as he got halfway up the stairs, he realized he had left the light on, so he went back down to turn it off. As he climbed the stairs again, about halfway up, he heard awful moans coming from behind him. Convinced there was someone else in the basement, he pulled his gun, and as soon as he did, the basement door slammed shut. As he went to run upstairs, he couldn't. He said his feet felt like they were glued to the steps, as if he was paralyzed. He called for backup, and he said there was about three or four minutes that went by where he was completely unable to move. When another security guard arrived and knocked on the basement door, it was as if his feet were immediately released. He opened the basement door, and the other officer said he looked as white as a sheet. Still convinced that there was someone else in the house, they called for more guards to come and help them search, but there wasn't anyone else in there. Pedro said that he was so shaken by this experience that it took him a good three to four weeks before he was able to go back inside. Now, he seemed entirely credible to me. I mean, you can tell he's telling the truth about what he experienced. But it isn't just the basement. Guards have also reported hearing children's laughter and the sound of them running across the floor over their heads when they are securing the first floor. But the strangest event of all allegedly took place one evening while the security alarm went off in the east wing of the house. When security entered the house, they were completely puzzled by what they had found. First, there was no sign of forced entry, no evidence of a fire, and no proof that anyone had been inside the house. However, there was a fire extinguisher in the middle of the floor, surrounded by a perfect circle of fire retardant. It was completely contained within this one part of the room, as if someone had just happily drawn a circle around it, with no residue on the can itself or outside the drawn circle. The extinguisher itself was completely empty, and despite searching, they never found the pin. Okay, so I've never used a fire extinguisher in my entire life, luckily, but when you use them, doesn't it just go, like, everywhere? Yes, it goes all over the place, and it makes a complete mess. The residue gets all over everything in the room that you use it in. So that's totally weird that it was just a perfect circle with it sitting right in the middle of it. It's incredibly weird. Huh. Security guards have also encountered some strange things while walking the grounds. Apparently, on numerous occasions, they hear singing, as if a woman is standing not five feet away from them, but there's absolutely no one there. And it's not just security guards who report strange encounters. Daytime workers and visitors have heard disembodied voices and unexplained knocking. They have seen apparitions of children and adults. They also report strange orbs of light and phantom faces in windows. And they will be in the room, leave and come back, and they swear that certain objects have been moved around. Now, here's the thing. None of these claims are anything new. They have been going on for quite some time. Way back in 1824, the Marquis de Lafayette, who was a French soldier and friend of Thomas Jefferson, spent a few days in the Randolph house, and he too also claimed to have had paranormal encounters of his own. He wrote, quote, I considered myself fortunate to lodge in the home of a great man, Peyton Randolph. Upon my arrival, as I entered through the foyer, I felt a hand on my shoulder. It nudged me as if intending to keep me from entering. I quickly turned around, but found no one there. The nights were not restful, as the sounds of voices kept me awake for most of my stay. End quote. At least 30 known deaths have occurred in the Randolph home in its 300-plus-year existence. 
That's not counting the many soldiers who have died inside the walls when it was used as a hospital during the Civil War. So, who was Peyton Randolph, and why is his home so haunted? Well, the wounded soldiers probably have something to do with it. Yeah, I would agree with that. The Peyton Randolph House is considered the oldest original house in Colonial Williamsburg. It was built in 1715 by William Robertson, who lived in the house for less than 10 years. Later, he sold it to Sir John Randolph. The house wasn't quite big enough, so Sir John had a second house built on the eastern side of the original structure, which was later joined to the original house, although... There was no internal access between it and the rest of the house. Because it was added onto in various stages, the two-story wood frame house has different roof lines. One is hip and one is gabled. Standing outside looking at the front of the house, the main house looks like a perfect rectangle with 13 windows, seven windows on the top floor, and six windows on the first floor. There are two rambling additions to the back that create an L shape. Sir John Randolph was the first Virginia-born colonist to be knighted, and he was also quite wealthy. When he died, the house was then passed on to his wife, Susanna, and then when she passed on, the house went to Peyton, their 24-year-old son. Peyton Randolph was no slouch. By 1751, he and his wife, Betty, were living in the Randolph home, even though Peyton was pretty busy as the Speaker of the House of Burgesses. Then in 1774, as if he wasn't already busy enough, he was elected the presiding officer at the First Continental Congress. Wow, that's a big deal. He actually chaired the meeting when Patrick Henry made his infamous speech, Give me liberty or give me death. Wow. Randolph drafted several objections to the Stamp Act, but Henry's resolutions won out over his because he wasn't there to be able to vote on them. Well, that stinks. (laughs) That it does. Several meetings between the Founding Fathers happened in and around Williamsburg, and of course, these included the Randolph House. He then served on the Second Continental Congress for a little while, before his death. He died from a stroke, unfortunately, in 1775, while having dinner with his cousin, Thomas Jefferson. Ah. I know. And this is interesting to me, because... He wasn't just related to Thomas Jefferson. He was also related to Robert E. Lee. Oh, that is cool. So he was pretty instrumental in getting this country started. Like he was there at the beginning, literally. Yes. And the only reason I think we don't really know much about him was because he died in 1775 before everything kind of panned out. Yeah. Another interesting fact is that when Randolph died, A number of his books, which he inherited from his father, were given to Thomas Jefferson, who then added them to his own library, and that library became the first books in the Library of Congress. Wow, that's cool. Isn't it, though? Betty and Peyton Randolph didn't have any kids, so when he passed away, Betty inherited the house. In 1781, she opened the house to French General Comte Rochambeau, and it became the French headquarters during the Revolutionary War. He was instrumental in helping George Washington take hold of Yorktown. When she passed away, there wasn't anyone left to inherit the house, so it was sold at an auction on February 19, 1783. Now, in the 1800s, the house was owned by Mary Monroe Peachy, She was the one who invited the Marquis de Lafayette to stay there for two nights during his tour of the colonies in 1824. Now, this is when he claimed that something touched him on the shoulder, and he couldn't sleep because he kept hearing disembodied voices. The Peachy family still owned the home during the Civil War. During that time, it was used as a hospital for both Union and Confederate soldiers during the Battle of Williamsburg in 1862. So I'm going to interrupt you for just a second. I know you're up to the Civil War, but prior to that, we're talking Virginia. So were there enslaved people living on the Randolph property? 
Yes, there was. And the number I saw was that there were 27 enslaved people during the Randolph years. Okay, so that could certainly add to spiritual unrest in the house, too. Okay, so now I'll scoot you back to the Civil War. One of the Confederate soldiers returned to the house as a boarder while he was attending William and Mary College. But sadly enough, he died in the house of tuberculosis. And two other soldiers died in the house also when they decided to settle an argument with a duel. So it wasn't just wounds from the war that caused soldiers to die in the house. But it could explain two of the apparitions that are frequently seen in the house. On the second floor, guests and residents alike have claimed that they have woken up in the middle of the night to see a white shimmering figure of a man standing in the corner of the room. Their apparition could be any of the fallen soldiers, from one who died in the house after the battle to the man who was a college student. Employees have reported seeing a young man in other parts of the house also. He is said to be dressed in colonial-era clothing and that they immediately think that he's a reenactor. But then when they ask each other about it, you know, like, hey, who's the new guy up on the second floor? No one else seems to know who they're referring to. That's creepy. The Peachy family also allegedly lost several children to illness while living there, and one of their sons died when he fell from a tree. Now, let me say, I spent a good chunk of time trying to confirm this stuff, and I failed miserably, mostly because there just isn't a lot out there about them. I did find evidence that Mary Peachy did have three children, two boys and a girl, and that one of her sons lived to be 75 years old. So I don't know how legitimate the claims are about the several children that have died there. Right. But one of the claims in the Peyton Randolph house is that children can be heard running around and laughing in the upstairs rooms after hours. And in an interview that I mentioned earlier with former security guard Pedro Jones, he also said that he would receive two to three calls a week from a secretary who works in the Randolph house. She claims she could hear a baby crying inside the walls. Hmm. He said they would always respond, but they never heard anything, although she insisted that she heard the baby crying. He said that administration didn't want to put holes in the wall to look for anything because the original wallpaper was still there, so he doesn't think they ever found anything. But she most definitely believed that she heard crying coming from inside the walls. Wow. And, you know, the children could be from any time period. They don't necessarily have to be from the Peachy family. You know, like, I think people like to connect to older times, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that old. But anyway, the, the video that you're talking about, is the link in the show notes? Yes, and people can just Google it. The Peyton Randolph Haunted House. You should be able to find it with that description. It's about 10 minutes long because he goes into stories about other haunted buildings in Williamsburg as well. Oh, cool. Now, people also believe that they've seen the apparition of Mary Monroe Peachy as well. And the accounts of that are pretty creepy. Apparently, she is most often seen in a bedroom on the second floor. In the daytime, the room is quite cozy. But when the residents fall asleep, they were sometimes woken up in the middle of the night by a woman saying their name. Then they would claim to actually see her, an older, gaunt-looking lady, dressed in a long, flowing gown and wearing a lace cap. When she knew that they had somehow been able to see her, she would then appear very distressed, wringing her hands together and grieving sadly. She would also be seen stroking the bones of her skeletal face. Jeez. I know. Can you imagine? No. In the 1920s, the Peyton Randolph House, also sometimes called the Randolph Peachy House, was purchased by the Wilson Bell family, and they owned it until the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation purchased the main building from them in 1938. But residents still lived in portions of the home way up until the 1960s, when Colonial Williamsburg was able to purchase the entire estate. 
Part of the home was used as lodging until 1968, and there are several stories of people leaving in the middle of the night because they were woken up by something grabbing their legs while they were sleeping or being shaken awake. In the book, The Hauntings of Williamsburg, Jamestown and Yorktown by Jackie Barron, one account describes a guest being woken up by the sensation of someone tugging on their arm. They fell back asleep, but they were woken up again by something that was shaking their whole body. They thought it had to be another person that had come into the room, but there wasn't anyone else in there with them. This could be the same entity that allegedly tried to push a female hostess down the stairs. She was literally holding on to the railing, feeling as though someone was pushing or shoving her over and over. That's scary, too. So as far as who each of these entities could be, of course it's not clear to me. If there's just two adults there, a male and a female, and at least one child, or if it's several different entities. And there's also some debate over who they are. Some staff believe Peyton Randolph himself is still there, as well as Betty. Some say it's Mary Peachy and her children. But who really knows? The Marquis de Lafayette thought the home was also haunted, and that was back in 1824. What we do know is that when they put in the Parkway Tunnel in the 1940s, They dug up quite a bit of the Peyton Randolph land, and they discovered all kinds of cool artifacts, including evidence of a colonial-era liquor still. Oh, that's cool. Well, it was, but it sadly got bulldozed. Oh. And they discovered quite a trove of Native American artifacts like pottery, and, well, they also found two Native American burial grounds. Oh. So when you think about it, you have more than 300 years of history where the Peyton Randolph House stands, from Native American grave sites to enslaved people being kept there, then from the Revolutionary War to the Civil War and all of the dozens of other lifetimes of people living there from the 1870s to today. That's a lot of history in one house. That it is. So with all that said, you kind of have all the groundwork laid out for some paranormal activity to occur. And if you want to visit the Peyton Randolph House today, there are numerous daytime tours as well as nighttime ghost walks. So it's definitely a place to put on your paranormal places to visit bucket list. It sounds like it. Holy cow. I know. I'd, I'd like to go visit the place. There's all kinds of stuff going on there. That there is. So for all of you that are into the paranormal, you might want to check this place out. Well, I guess with all that said, that about wraps it up for this episode, all you fellow wanderers. Yeah, and don't forget that if you like what you heard, please take a moment and leave us a five-star rating and a review on your favorite listening platform. We'd really appreciate that because it helps us move up on the list so people can find us and join us just like you do. And if you happen to be perusing Facebook in your free time, you could follow our page there, too. I post pictures every week of our upcoming topics, and it's a great place to start some discussions. Uh, We'd like to hear about places maybe you've visited or experiences that you've had. We'd love to hear about those things. Yeah, I'd love to hear from all you listeners out there about your paranormal experiences pictures and stories would be nice. And with that said, please join us again next week for an all-new episode of Where Our Minds Wander. We'll see you next week. 